Welcome to the ride. Life, Work, and Wealth Podcast with your host, Chris Darrow. Years ago, Chris was a firefighter and a paramedic and witnessed many people not getting another tomorrow, and it shaped who he is now as a financial strategist. Chris doesn't just help people plan for a secure tomorrow, he helps them plan for a better today. Chris lives in Burlington, Ontario, and is an investment advisor at Three Hats Financial, a trade name of Harborfront Wealth Management, an IROC dealer. Let's get to it. Having a special needs member of the family presents unique emotional and financial concerns. Chris Duro's guest today has worked with those families for many years. Fred Ryle has been an estate practitioner for more than 40 years and for the last 15 has worked with special needs children and adults. In fact, he received the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Award from the Governor General of Canada for those efforts. And that is just one of the accomplishments he can list on his resume. So, Chris, tell us more about Fred and the communities he works with. Thanks, Patrice. Yes, I'm very excited to have Fred on the show today. So Fred, as you mentioned, has a very unique practice. Uh, I'm going to emphasize very unique. As you mentioned, you mentioned he specializes in working with adults and families with special needs, children and adults. And what he does, and we'll get into that today, is he just is a huge resource in the sense of helping them manage the emotional and financial burdens that comes with these families and just becomes like I said, a very big resource for them. So I met Fred a few years ago through a mutual friend, and we've done quite a bit of joint work together over the years. And uh, Fred, first of all, thanks again for coming on. And I'm going to just jump in here and ask you, so why don't you tell my listeners how you got started in this unique role that you now have and how you got started in the financial services since some of my football fan listeners might like to hear that story. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no worries. Well, first of all, Patrice and Chris, thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's a privilege for me to share the next 20 or 25 minutes with your audience. And uh, more importantly to your questions, you know, for the first 25 years, I was a general practitioner uh, taking care of business owners, taking care of professionals in a variety of different ways. And it was really two estate lawyers Uh, some 15, 16 years ago, that pulled me aside and they said, uh, Fred or Freddie, we want you to change your practice and we think you would be an ideal champion for a segment of the population that is underserved and they need someone to go out there and talk to and find a way to help this, you know, these families you know, that either have a cognitive or physical, you know, disabled, uh, you know, child or adult. And, you know, your other question regarding the percentage of the population, it's now up to about 15%, Chris, uh, of the Canadian population. And when we do the math, if let's say we have 35 million, you know, residents, uh, you know, in Canada, and you take 15% of that, it's approximately, you know, 5.4 million. And I can tell you just in, in Ontario, uh, there's approximately three, 3.3 million families. Now, the other question that you had, Chris, was regarding uh, how did all this begin? (laughs) Well, uh, I had the privilege of playing uh, professional football for a couple of years uh, for the uh, local professional team here, the Toronto Argonauts. And, uh, what I was, uh, I, I got a very nasty neck, neck injury. And uh, after two years, and uh, that ended my football career. And uh, the financial services um, community got a hold of me. They thought I might uh, be ideal working in that community. And that's when it all began way back in uh, August of 1975. From foot from football to finances, <laughs> that's definitely yeah, F and F. <laughs> yeah, definitely a different uh, different background there. So, and that let's go back to those numbers. Like fifteen percent of the population. The, the, these aren't small numbers. And from everything I've read, and you can confirm this, the numbers are actually increasing over the years, not decreasing. You are one hundred percent correct. I know when I was interviewed on a TV, uh, 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 you know, a couple of years ago, you know, and when I was talking to Stats Canada 
And they were saying it was like maybe, you know, 12.9, 13%. So you are correct, Chris. It's now up to 14.9 or let's say 15%. So it is increasing. Yeah. So like I said, not not small numbers by any means. So my f- my first real experience where it actually resonated me with me that what these families go through is actually when I was a paramedic, uh, when I was back, when I was doing that job, um, it wasn't just all emergency calls. You'd be, you would get calls, scheduled calls to go do a transport. And what that was, is you'd go to, um, the client's home. It would be a scheduled pickup or sorry, patient. I'm mixing the two terms of client and patient, patient, So it wasn't an emergency call. You'd be scheduled to go pick up a patient that had health issues and you transport them to a hospital for an appointment. And sometimes these transfers would be special needs children with quite a few health issues on top of that. And due to where I worked, it was kind of out more rural that many of these pickups would be up to an hour or so with the child and the parent sitting in the back of the ambulance. And you're not racing, screaming down the streets, lights and sirens. It's just a a, a regular drive with with me in the back and just making sure everything's okay. And uh, at that time you get a lot of, you just basically would chat with the parents for quite a while. And I remember being a 22 year old single young guy and sitting back there and just listening to what these parents had to do on a daily basis with some of these high level special needs children. It was, it was absolutely incredible to say the least. Like the parents literally knew more about the child's condition than the doctors. I'm not exaggerating there. It was incredible listening to how well they knew their child's condition. And they would have, I remember a couple of times, like they would have binders that I was helping lift into the, the back of the am- ambulance is a while ago. So obviously the, the technology was there, but not anywhere it was near today. Um, this is over 20 years ago. So they just had binders of the information on the child and appointments and everything. And to this day, I still have one of the mothers. She still stands out in my head um, about her little boy, Corey. I remember he had just a, a whole bunch of health issues on top of his disability. And she just looked exhausted. And um, she was just, it, it was like almost like a vent session for her just to just get that hour of just sitting there, having me kind of look over Corey and her just kind of sit back. And she was just filling me in on her days where just nothing but caring for him. And from the minute she woke up to the minute she put her head on the pillow, it was taking care of him. And I still remember thinking, like how strong she was and just the experience to speak to her over that time and get to know what she does in a day. Um, To this day, I still say like parents, especially these children have to be some of the strongest people I've ever met. It's just incredible what they have to do on a daily basis. So of course, Fred, you and I have talked numerous times. Like I just so happy to have you here because the work you do is so important and just thank you for doing all of this. So Sorry, Chris, just a just a dovetail on that. And you're you're 100 percent right. The you know, the fortitude and the resilience of the moms and dads, you know, that are there and they're dealing with their, you know, their special needs son or daughter for a moment. Chris, can you imagine if there's a family that has two, never mind one, but two? And in actual fact, I've got one family that has three myself having three, three children that don't have any special needs. I know how exhausting that was when they were young that I can't even imagine now that, and that's what I mean is it it literally, they're some of the strongest people I've ever met and what they have to go through day to day. So anything we can do to help um, for sure is it's just, you must be very proud of what you do and helping this very special group of individuals and at least take some of the stress away from them. And I, and you and I have chatted over the years of some of the stories and all of that. So, well, you know, just on that note is, you know, um, a famous author these days, you know, Simon Sinek, and he talks about finding your purpose. Well, I can tell you that I have found my purpose, you know, some 16 years ago, when, as to your point, Chris, as when you realize that you are making a difference in these people's lives, you know, whether it be emotionally or financially or mapping out a life plan or creating a binder for them, it doesn't matter. The point is, is they need uh, a support group and uh, we have the privilege of being part of their village and it's pretty cool. Yeah, no, great, great stuff. So let's just, um, so we can give some nuggets to the listeners here. We'll get going through 
kind of five areas that you touch on, obviously quite in depth, but today with time, we're going to just kind of touch on those five areas. And let's start with the first one um, in your process, which is obviously is legal. Um, Absolutely. We know that in our experience, Chris, that when we sit down with a family and we start at the sort of, you know, look at their, what have they done legally in terms of, you know, do they have a properly structured will, a powers of attorney, and is the wording of a Henson trust in the will for mom and dad? And when we review that, uh, oftentimes mom and dad may or may not have a will, but if they do, we review it with a fine tooth comb And unfortunately, they do not have the wording for a Henson Trust. So what we do then is we work with them, we help uh, give them ideas and thoughts and structure around building a much better and more complete will and POA. And then what we do is then we use one of our estate planning um, lawyers. We are fortunate that we work with uh, about 12 law firms Uh, now. And then we actually accompany the client uh, to the law firm. And we make sure that the lawyer has uh, captured the spirit and all of the intricacies of the will drafting. So we can actually put it into place, execute it and make it workable. So from a legal standpoint, we often say to the mom and dad, the cornerstone of any a state plan is a well-structured will, power of attorney, and a Henson Trust. And one of the big things the Henson Trust, just I, obviously working with you and and um, and that is that is is the not having the clawback of income. Correct. Absolutely. We will get into that in the the third step of our process, but you're absolutely right, Chris, is that because the Henson Trust is an exempt asset, one of the things we want to do is not only make sure that this Henson Trust, the wording is in the will, remember it's a testamentary trust. So which means is that it is created at the time when either mom or dad leave this earth. So not only we want to make sure that trust is created, but in addition to that, we want to make sure that it's properly funded. So there's enough money in that trust for food and clothing and shelter and therapy and medicine and all of these things that their child is going to need, not just today, But we have to forecast that out depending on the mortality of the child is uh, it could be 50 or 60 years. So we have to make sure that, um, you know, there's enough money. And to make sure that the money comes out in a way that it's not going to claw back um, government benefits, which is very obviously very important. So sorry, I didn't mean to jump, jump the gun there. So let's, we can now, now the next, your next step in your process would now come down to tax planning, if I'm correct. Absolutely. And we have found that uh, in the tax planning, there's a couple of areas that we, you know, work with just not only the moms and dads, but if they have an accountant or they don't, we introduce the disability tax credit to the mom and dad. Some of them have applied for it. Some of them have not. And we find that if they haven't applied, then what we will do is we will work with them to uh, structure and prepare a disability tax credit with all the supporting evidence. And then we have a, a, a disability tax credit specialist, Peter Curtis, that works with us and he's part of our team. And then what he reviews it, because he deals with CRA every day and then we send it off to Peter to make sure we've crossed all the T's, dotted all the I's and then he sends it into CRA and then we wait for approval. But as Peter says, if we follow the process, our success rate is north of 90% of getting that approval from CRA, which is so, so, so important. In addition to that, Chris, is that not only from a tax planning standpoint, we want to make sure that the the plan and what we're creating is also what qualifies for a disability. uh, We call it a qualified disability trust. And that is just a very um, unique way where we can use a graded tax rate 
rather than a top marginal rate as that particular trust is earning income. So again, these are the things we look at that moms and dads may not even be aware of because there's such a plethora of information out there. And as you said, you know, it's a full-time job just taking care of, you know, the child or the adult just in regular daily activities and all that. It doesn't surprise us at all that when we talk to people, you know, we'll ask them, well, how much planning have you done? And unfortunately, a lot of them have said, we don't, haven't done any because we don't know where to start. And I guess it does, it, this planning does provide peace of mind in two ways. Uh, one being, yes, like you just mentioned, if uh, obviously the parents have a ton on their plate and they may have missed opportunities that they didn't even know exist or haven't gotten around to. But for the ones that like you and I had a, had a call with a couple there not too long ago. And as we were going through the process, they actually had, they had a few of the check marks. So I would think the, I would think the other piece of mind is that for the families that have done some of the planning, this is just like a, a double check, like, oh, okay, he's the expert here. And wow, we've actually done some of this. So I, I feel that we are good and we're not necessarily missing as much as we thought. So I imagine that gives families peace of mind in two different ways. 100%, 100%, another set of eyes. And when we work with those families, we congratulate them. We say, listen, well done that you're able to do this or you're able to do that. And you know what you've done is really, really good. So a pat on the back, uh, we love giving, but you're right. It uh, does make them feel pretty good that they're on the right road. And that, that disability tax credit, you can go back quite a while, quite a ways back to grab missed benefits. Correct. 100%. Yep. Yeah, we can go back 10 years of unused credits. It yeah. is 10. Okay. And that's a wonderful surprise when not only we get the approval from CRA, and then we go back 10 years and we find there's, you know, 10 or 11 or $12,000 of unused credits that um, will be deposited into the mom or dad's bank account. Um, it's a wonderful feeling. It really is of this unfound money that, uh, and believe you, believe me, Chris, you and I both know an extra 10 or 11 or $12,000 um, is pretty cool. Okay. And, and the next well, the next step then um, that I know because is you is, go, is you go into like government plans and benefits, correct? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And this is where you know I probably spend a lot of time only because of again, there's a lot of moving parts to it. But what we do, Chris, is we break up sort of the what governments are available or what silos of the government we're going to work with. And there's really three of them. The first is the ODSP, Ontario Disability you know, Support Payments. And that is something where you have to apply for. You get approved with that. And that could be anywhere from about $800 to $1,200 a month that it begins at age 18. And it'll run to 65, age 65 and beyond. So when you think about if we could just use this example, if the um, young man or woman is 18 years of age and they're getting $1,000, which is $12,000 a year from age 18 to age 65, um, that's $540,000, Chris. And we want to make sure that that family never loses that money or ever cut off or ever reduced. And that's then where the where I kind of jumped the gun with the Henson Trust to make sure that we you don't get clawed back on that. Yes, absolutely. Now, one of the things, though, Chris, and you're so right. When you look at ODSP, it's really broken up in two um, uh, two divisions or two parts. First is income, and the other is benefits. So oftentimes, many families don't realize that the benefits that are being offered through ODSP, you know, such as free health and free dental, can be equally very significant, you know, to you know to that you know to that child or adult. So again, income and benefits, and that's just that one silo of you know of ODSP. And then the next one would be is because they've qualified for a, a, a disability tax credit, 
then that opens up another door, which you are well aware of, which is uh, the RDSPs, Registered Disability Savings Plans, that was created by our former finance minister in the year 2009. So again, there is available money from the government uh, in terms of a grant and a bond. And it's significant, Chris, there's $90,000 on the table that we want to make sure that the moms and dads are not only aware of it, but how to get every cent on top of the personal contributions they're going to make. And then finally, in the government benefits, which we find a lot of people are unaware of, there's another silo of the government, which we call the DSO, the Developmental Services of Ontario, or passport funding. And that is a separate division, a separate wing. And there is a um, money minimum of $5,000, depending on the severity, you know, of the disability, you know, with the child or adult, but it's a reimbursement plan. So again, what, what we try to do is show people, number one, do you have a properly structured will, POA, Henson Trust? Number two, have you gone down that road in the, making sure that you've got a you know, disability tax credit? It's going to qualify for the disability trust. And then third, how are you maximizing the ODSP portion, RDSP, and then the passport funding? So you can see there's lots of moving parts and uh, and believe me, it is it's complicated. But we've done it enough times over the years that we can try to remove the angst and anxiety away from the mums and dads. Yeah, and that's that's a that's that's quite a few moving parts. And, they, and <laughs> the uh, the registered disability savings plan. So for listeners, that's the RDSP that Fred's talking about. Um, if listeners aren't aware of what that is, it's just it's a way to put earnings away and have them build or build up tax-free until eventually you take out the money. But what I, what I also found interesting with that is that is that it's parents and grandparents, correct? That if they pass away, that they could actually roll their RSPs into those RDSPs. Yes, that's where that happened. in I think uh, in the summer or the spring of about 2012. So uh, a couple of years later, that you're absolutely correct. So another one is is that if you know moms and dads when their child you know was born, and you hear of many moms and dads, including uh, including myself, we set up little uh, RESPs and scholarship plans for for you know the, for our children. And then hopefully they would go to post-secondary, whether it be college or university. Well, with a special needs families and that develops, what happens is moms and dads are going to look at their son or daughter, maybe age 13 or 14, and recognize that they will not be going to a college or a university. So one of the improvements from the RDSP, Chris, is that we can actually roll over our ESPs into the RDSP. Yeah, so very, very flexible for these kids, which is fantastic because the, the families need need any help they can get from that. And that's fantastic that we not only was the RDSP d- developed, which is 2009, which I can't believe it's even been that long because I remember when it first came out. <laughs> but yeah. it's good to see that they keep offering even more flexibility to this very important tool to have in a, in a family's finances. So that's great. Uh, let's now, the next one is insurance. Yeah. The insurance planning <clears throat> or the, you know, the, the fourth sort of stage of our process is really designed that we are looking at two things. Number one, if there is insurance, we want to look at, there's an amount of insurance that would be payable in the event of mom and dad leaving this earth, but we're really looking at that amount. Is that amount going to be redirected or to the Henson Trust in terms of funding the amount of money that their child will need, number one? And we find, Chris, that the lawyers are the biggest advocates of that, that they recognize if they're sitting down with the moms and dads and looking at their assets and looking at their liabilities, they're going to 
have a, a sort of a, a picture of, you know, do they have enough money or not? And then they often will recommend one way to fill that gap would be then is the purchase of some life insurance. And what we often do, Chris, is we will set up a joint policy payable first to die. So by doing that, when the mom or the dad passes away, that insurance becomes, you know, really important. It funds the Henson Trust. So the money is now where it should be. And it also removes the anxiety and angst of the surviving parent, because now they don't have to worry about where that money is going to come from their special needs child. It's already there. It's safe and secure. And it sits in the Henson Trust. No, and then that's we've had many discussions on some of the situations where that's been implemented. And it's not just as simple as just going and buying a life insurance policy and 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 na- naming your child as a beneficiary. There's a lot more moving parts to that. Well, you bring up a very good point, Chris, because the other side of the insurance planning is we very carefully look at the beneficiary uh, you know, declaration because we want to make sure that in the planning process. We don't have any uh, hiccup or a pitfall or something that could be problematic in our overall planning, such as to your point, our goal, your goal is always going to be how do we protect that $540,000 coming from the ODSP? And the last thing we want is one of our our, our children are going to get this large inheritance and that could throw everything offside. And that becomes very problematic. Last uh, step in the process that you should go touch on is now the investments. And the investments, again, our, our goal, Chris, is really to look at the beneficiary designations again. So whether moms and dads have RRSPs Uh, They may have an RESP, they may have a tax-free savings account, they may have money in stocks and bonds and mutual funds, segregated funds, wherever, I don't know, every family has, you know, money in a a few buckets or lots of buckets, it doesn't matter, we just want to make sure, once again, the beneficiary designations are in line with the will planning, the Henson Trust planning, the government planning, so we have no support prizes, you know, going forward. And then, of course, on the investment side, you know, we would just refer it back to you. You're the investment experts. You you can build an investment plan, just that we're going to walk with you to make sure that whatever you build is going to be, you know, uh, sort of in sync in the planning that we're doing. Yeah. And that's how we've worked is just going, is obviously this is our, this is our wheelhouse where we now develop the portfolios and you and I going back and forth, just making sure everything's aligned. And that's why I like having specialists as you as well, Fred, because obviously it's impossible to know everything. And you are the specialist in the, in this dealing with, with special needs children and their families. So it's nice having you as a resource for these cases. And then we just take each part that we're good at to make sure that the family is getting the best benefit all of all, all of this. Well, it's uh, thank you. And, you know, it's again, to me, it's like that. You've heard me use that term village. I become your resource and I become part of your village and you become part of our village, you know, going forward. Because, again, as we have new families and we take on new families and if they don't have an investment advisor, then we'll just be saying, well, listen, one, you know, a, a really good friend, he's very, very bright, they're very articulate, all of that. Let me introduce you to Chris, to them, because you need him to take care of the investment side, and we'll take care of the government and the legal and the tax side, but we're going to work in sync. And, it, 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 you know, it's a nice, it, it, it's a nice collaboration. Yeah, it just feels like when you're done, when, whenever we've been, we've finished these, it just feels like no stern, no stone has not been unturned, and we've kind of just crash tested every aspect of it. So, it's obviously important to have things organized in general for finances. But I just would like you to just give the listeners the example of Jake and why it's important to have everything in place in a binder and document it. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank you for reminding me. 
This is uh, several years ago, and Jake was about uh, six foot four and 240 pounds at age 18. And uh, very, uh, you know, uh, he is was diagnosed uh, on the, the spectrum of autism. And uh, in the part of our planning, uh, what we sat down with the mom and dads and we said, well, listen, you know, who's going to be the trustee or who's going to be the guardian of Jake? You know, if mom and dad are not here and they had decided that while well, he's very close to one of his aunts, his aunt is uh, obviously a lot older and she might weigh 90 pounds. Well, the uh, problem with that is, and I got to know the family, is Jake uh, likes pizza at 5.30 every Friday. That better be documented somewhere. And, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute, because if it's not, and the guardian or the aunt or, the, uh, you know, doesn't know this, well, what does Jake expect? He wants his pizza on Friday at 530. And I've witnessed it where, you know, mom and dad have ordered the pizza. The pizza delivery guy comes. He opens the door, grabs a pizza, throws the money at the pizza guy and slams the door. And he's happy as a lark and it all works well. But can you imagine, though, if there's no mom or dad and we've got a 90 pound aunt and she does not know why he is going ballistic because of it was never documented. No one ever told her that he likes pizza on Friday at 530. So one of the things we do. Chris, is we create a binder and with this binder that we use and we put all of our information in really comes from the community living uh, areas. So whether it be Mississauga, it could be community living Toronto, it could be community living Oakville or wherever, wherever. And it is the support and trustee advisory service. It's a 44 page document, Chris, but I'm telling you, it is a living document. Because what we find is that we want mom and dad to download everything about their son or daughter that's between their ears in terms of food, clothing, shelter, meds, doctors, village, who's important, what kind of ice cream they like, doesn't matter because if mom and dad aren't here, how in, how in God's earth is that trustee or guardian going to know everything about that child or adult? They won't. But if they've got this, if they've got this binder that mom and dad have taken the time to document everything, we have the best of both worlds. Yeah, no, I, I've always liked that story about that because it just shows like the import. Of course, people know to document about medication and all these health issues and doctor contacts and specialist contacts, but something as simple as, yeah, the pizza at 5 30 PM, it's things like that that are very important or special birthdays or special things or who's important or who's he or who is the circle of friends that they have all of these and the other thing too chris is that that's as of now three years from now it will change he, you know there could be more meds or less meds there could be doctors that are changed so it becomes a living document that has to be updated and what what we try to do is update those you know every you know every 2 to 3 years with the clients to say it's time to either have another meeting whether it be zoom or we get together face to face and we just review that document well, Fred, I really, really appreciate you coming on the show today. As always, I always love our chats and having a good talk. So I look <laughs> forward too. to seeing you again soon, my friend. And thanks so much again for coming on and, and just running my listeners through your steps and process. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a privilege and I look forward to working on many more files with you and how we can make a difference in these people's lives. So for me, the, the regular way is just through my website threehatsfinancial.ca. And of course you can contact me and I can put you in touch with Fred as well. Or as Fred also has his own website that you can contact him through, uh, which is fredryle.ca. Gentlemen, that was some fantastically helpful information. Thank you so much. Fred Ryle and your host, of course, Chris Duro. Be sure to follow this podcast, The Rod, Life, Work and Wealth, to know when the latest episode is ready, and especially with this episode, make sure you share with friends and family. 
Thank you for listening to The Ride, Life, Work, and Wealth Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. All comments are of a general nature and should not be relied upon as individual advice. The views and opinions expressed in this commentary may not necessarily reflect those of Harborfront Wealth Management. While every attempt is made to ensure accuracy, facts and figures are not guaranteed. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing or tax advice. Please seek advice from your accountant regarding anything raised in the content of the podcast regarding your individual tax situation. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.